Hello and welcome to the Neighborhood Money Podcast, a video podcast here to help you build a life you deserve. We're Kevin and Drew, and Hello. today, Drew, we're going to kind of piggyback off of last week's episode when we talked about emergency funds and saving. This week's going to yep. be all about how much you should have saved or you should save for retirement by age. And I really like these types of episodes because one, no matter where you're at in your saving career, or maybe if you're at retirement, mm -hmm. you can kind of relate and you can kind of get some sort of information. And it's actually a really nice benchmark you know, for me specifically, I like to look at these numbers and say, hey, where do I stack up when I look at, you know, I'm 30 now, you know, how much do I have saved for retirement? And in this episode, we're going to dive into that. We're going to tell you exactly how much you should based off of a fidelity study. And this actually, this article that we have pulled is from, it kind of seems like our favorite website, at least currently CNBC, but you're I'm really looking forward to this one today. Yeah. This will be another episode of showing like rules of thumb. I feel like a lot of the times we talk, we do a lot of rule of thumbs, and I think they're so great because I personally like to see benchmarks and having those sets of like numbers being like, all right, this is where I can quantify it, I can measure, I can make it measurable, and then I can kind of, you know, compare apples to apples in, in as a sorts. But uh, I think going through this episode will be fun, and I think even. For some people that are just, you know, maybe their younger years and they feel like they just don't have much in there, like they feel like they have a good amount, but they don't feel like they have millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars. I think you'll see that depending on what age you're at, if you're a little bit younger, that the power of compounding interest can have actually on your account where if you can consistently do what you're doing right now, where you have these accounts, you know, rolling that they will build up to where you want them to be eventually. So Drew, maybe the first place to start, because this article doesn't really kick it off this way, but maybe the first place to start is what is saving for retirement? Like where do you save on, you know, saving and investing? They're two different words, but they kind of get thrown out simultaneously, meaning the same thing when you think about retirement. Uh, but so we'll say saving and investing, at least for the purposes of this episode, is the same thing. I typically don't like to think that way. I always say investing for retirement because it's more so uh, that's the case. But Drew, when we think about saving or investing for retirement, where exactly do you do that? Well, for like saving or investing, I, I think if you have a job that gives you this 401k type of plan, that's a great place to start because a lot of the times your employer can, you know, help match whatever you put in there and it's pretty much just free money. Uh, so I think your first spot is like if you have a job that has some type of defined contribution plan, I think that's definitely something to look into. And if you don't, you don't have to really worry that much because there are other options out there, whether it be IRAs or different types of like investment vehicles where they don't necessarily have to be in the stock market, but you can might maybe start building some smaller hard assets and uh, things like that. Yeah, the options really are plentiful when you think about it. Like you said, individual retirement accounts or IRA are another option compared to the 401k where it's a retirement account that's going to give you tax advantages. But Drew, we've talked in the past about how it might make sense for you to use a non-retirement account if you're thinking about retiring early. So a traditional brokerage account is a really good option. Or if you know you want to go down the real estate avenue and not just direct, you know, specifically be in stocks and bonds, all of that stuff is available to you. And even if you don't want to buy physical assets and be a landlord, there's options out there too, where you can get into things such as real estate investment trusts or REITs. And you know, there's other companies, syndicates where you can go in and actually own a piece of property that will give you a little more exposure. So right now, Drew is kind of the best time. It's been, it's a better time now than it's ever been to actually save and invest for your retirement. And I think too, for you know, people that are have been in their jobs for a while or people are close to retirement, they might not get as much benefit out of this. But um, currently going through legislation on the federal level, they're trying to pass what's called the EARN Act right now. And part of that EARN Act is they want people want companies that have certain types of retirement to automatically enroll their employees into these plans. And then they have like I think it's minimum of like five percent that's just gonna automatically be put that like from pretty much day one 
um, or like whenever is either day one or like after that year of the full time and they can actually be eligible for it. Uh, so you automatically put into it because I think so much of the time people take the papers home with them and never sign up or they just are like, oh, I'll think about it and then it gets pushed off. So part of the thing that's going to be happening, it will probably be uh, a bill that will probably be passed is my guess. And if they have something along those lines of automatically enrolling people and then they have incremental automatic increases so i think after three or five years people should be up to 10 percent uh, uh of their money getting put into their retirement so i think going forward people will be having a lot much more in their retirement is is my guess uh the only way you wouldn't have that money going in there is if you specifically uh, went out and said, hey, I don't want money to get into, take it on my check, put it into there. I need to sign this piece of paper. Um, so I think as far as savings goes, I think a lot of people see it as uh, it can be something easily forgotten. And it might be something that's just going to be more automatic here going in the future. And as most things with our generation and the generations below, things are, will just get more and more automated. And that will include our retirement. And whether that's the benefit for the actual person or the benefit for the government because you're going to end up having much more money in deferred tax income accounts. And then by the time they take money out with minimum distributions or uh, whatever their distribution schedule will be, they're going to be ta- a lot more money will be taxed in the future off retirement accounts. Yeah, I don't know how exactly I feel about it because at face value, I think it's a really good idea to one, automatically enroll people in with the option of opting out because I think you should have full control of your money. I don't think anyone should be able to tell you what to do with it. But the fact that if a company automatically enrolls you, well, that's just one step you don't have to take, right? And how many people are in the boat of just being lazy or forgetting because when you start a new job, you just have everything thrown at you and you're like, Oh, I can do this later because you know, X, Y, Z is more important at this given time frame. So I really like that idea. I think you have to be a little bit careful, right? Because you have to understand where that money is going. And I, I, I fear that a lot of people are going to say, okay, well, I'm investing 5% or I'm saving 5% of my income into, you know, the company 401k. But what's gonna what's it gonna be invested in, right? Because you could just be going into the four hundred one k and saving or invested into like a money market fund, right? Which is going to give you terrible returns, and you're never gonna be able to save enough money for retirement if you go that route. So I, I think if you know if that is the case, or even if you are right now going into your four hundred one k or whatever accounts you're looking at, you have to make sure that the assets you're buying in those accounts align with your retirement goals because compound interest that you started the episode with Drew is a truly magical power that's really going to help you save more for your retirement. And so one of the things I like the most when it comes to saving for retirement from an asset standpoint, and again, this isn't financial advice, is I love my index funds. I think anyone that's listened to this episode knows that I love the S&P 500 index. I invest solely in that for my retirement uh, because I know what it's done historically speaking and over the long run, it's got low fees, et cetera. And so whether it's that or it's a different type of asset, you just need to make sure that it aligns with your goals over the long term. And there's financial advisors out there that can help you with that question. But just make sure that you know that if you're just saving into a money market account, well, that's pretty similar than just going into a savings account. And we all know that that's just not giving you any return. It's always funny. I, I always hear money market account. Uh, I, I feel like growing up, you know, I was like, Oh, there's CDs, there's bonds, there's money markets, there's stocks. And I always felt like money market was like in some investment tool. And I guess you get, <laughs> right. I guess technically it is, but they should just say it's just like a checking account. Right, I really exactly. think like that'd be the easiest way. They could say, Hey, the money market, it's just a checking account. So if you're not picking your investments going into these 401k plans, you're pretty much making less than 1% out of your money. And it'll just be sitting yep. there and you're going to be losing money. Uh, that's one way they should do it. And, you know, kind of going back a little bit on that Earn Act, I think maybe we should do an episode on it because I was just thinking about That'd it too. That'd be interesting. I'd be down. Speaking of retirement, they did have one part in there too or where they were 
saying the minimum distribution age, what was that? I think 72 or 72 and a half. They want to push that up to 75 by the year 2030. Uh, So that will be another nice thing too, where you're not going to have to be taking money out for your minimum distributions. And I guess just to piggyback off that too, something I was reading on top of that, (laughs) I've been doing a lot of reading lately, (laughs) was uh, if you are in retirement and have your money in an IRA or multiple IRAs, you do have to take a minimum distribution percentage off of each one of your IRAs. So say you had four IRAs for some reason, you have to take a minimum distribution out of each one of them, but you can also find out what that amount is and then take that lump sum out of just one of your IRAs, which I think is kind of interesting. So say if you had one IRA that just doesn't give you much interest, you don't have a bunch of money in there it might not be a bad account to kind of bleed your retirement out of because you're not really getting any interest or much compounding so like your accounts that have a large amount of money can really make your money work for you that's interesting too because then you could say well maybe one ira is invested into a money market account because i know i only have three to five years of cash in there and the other ones are invested into other assets that are a little more risky a little more volatile but you're not going to pull from it because you can kind of leverage the the fact that exactly you can leverage the fact that you can just pull from one account so that's pretty interesting but drew i like the idea of doing an episode on that earned act because i think it's really interesting and i think there's a lot we can pull out there there's a lot in it tidbits here in this episode but a lot of stuff that people should just really be aware of if they you know if that does pass and it does enact and come into law but with that drew let's dive into how much money should you have saved based on your age? And so obviously we, we're not going to go through every single age from 18 to 67, which is the normal retirement age, but we're going to go by decades. So we'll start at 30, we'll go all the way up to 60 and finish off at 67, which is the normal or which is the retirement age uh, to get social security or full social security, I should say. So Drew, the first one is age 30. And so you've gone through your 20s, you've gotten that you know first job out of high school or out of college, maybe you're in your career. And by the time you're 30 is when you hit your first saving milestone. And that is equal to one times your annual salary. Yeah, that one-to-one growth pretty much your gross number of your salary. Cause a lot of times sometimes it's like, do you take them on that your contract might say, or do you take them on that you actually are taking home uh, and paying? So we're, we're going to say be, for investing purposes, we want to be conservative on the, on the high side. So uh, in this article, for example, it says if you were making $55,000 for X year, then at, by the age 30, you should have, that $55 in some type of, uh, you know, assets that you have, whether they're a combination of just retirement account or a combination of just retirement and savings and maybe one other item. So those are things to think about for like a little rule of thumb. Yeah. And I like this one. What I kind of look at though is, you know, it's really easy because you think about like getting into like your 28, 29, 30, there's a good chance that you're going to be promoted or you'll have a jump in income. And I'm a little math nerdy, but I like to look at, okay, well, what actually is like my kind of like my average income by the time I'm 30? Cause that will give you a better understanding of where you're at. Cause it's, let's just say for, you know, we'll throw some numbers here. If you had a $55,000 job all the way to 29, and then all of a sudden you got bumped up to 75,000, well, probably in a year, you're not going to save seven, 25 grand. Right. And so you might feel, like you're behind where that actually might not be the case of just the timing. So just keep that in the back of your mind with all of these, they're rough, you know, rough estimates of where you should be, but generally speaking, however much money, you know, you've made on average per year is how much you should have saved by the time you're 30. So Drew jumping then into the next bucket is, the 40 year olds. And so now you've had your twenties, which you've had, you know, your five, maybe 10 years of working, depending on, you know, when you start 
But then you've also had your 30. So you've had a whole decade of work, a whole decade to save and invest and start using some of that compound interest. And so by the time you're 40, you should have three times your income. And do I forget if you use a $55,000 example, but let me use a $50,000 example so it's a little easier in numbers. So that means you should have $150,000 saved by the time you're 40. Three times your income. At this point, it might seem... Like, wow, how the heck can I save that much money? I'm only making this much a year to save three times that in a, de- in a decade. That seems like a lot of money. And I think earlier when I say compounding interest, this is where that really comes into play, where you can say, if most of your money is, you know, in this article says save, but if most of your money is invested into the market and you constantly put into it, you're constantly dollar cost averaging, that's where you're really seeing your money work for you. And that's where you see like your large amount of your returns. If you were to actually save your money in a money market or a checking account to get three times your income in a decade would be extremely, extremely difficult. So you have to find something that gives you some sort of rate of return that can at least keep up with inflation or beat it. Yeah. I mean, your goal is to beat it essentially, right? Because if you just keep up with inflation, unfortunately, you probably won't have enough at retirement because inflation will just eat that away. So Drew, I think a really good example is if you make $50,000 a year and you save let's just say 10%, that's going to be $5,000 per year. If you say $5,000 per year over the course of the decade, that's 50,000. Okay. Following me, which if you add that, it, just double it. Say you worked your entire twenties, your entire thirties, and you saved that in a money market account where you're not getting barely any interest, you're going to have a hundred thousand dollars of savings. Well, you're already you know, a third short of this rule of thumb. And so I think that example shows you that you can't just save your way to retirement. You truly have to be invested into assets that are going to grow that money over the long term. That's absolutely correct. Uh, you know, and then now going on to 50, I think this is where it really starts getting crazy. This is the fun part. This is where the compounding truly starts kicking up. By sa- the investing or savings by age 50, they're saying six times your income. And it just like these numbers, like to it's saying when 10 years, you're doubling your money in your account. So w- once again, to just have money in a checking account would be almost impossible. So th- th- well, we're saying right. this is, so I think this is painting more of a picture for me or for, you know, the listener that it's a very, very important to constantly and consistently put money away into a uh, investment that can give you a rate of return. Because if not, to have these rule of thumbs and to make yourself feel comfortable at retirement of around 67, uh, it would be extremely, extremely difficult. And another, I think, rule of thumb that we didn't talk about earlier is, well, how much should you actually be saving and investing for retirement? This article states that at 25, from 25 to 67, if you save and invest 15%, you're going to be pretty good. And I really I really like that 15% number, but obviously people can't always start there. And we've talked about this all the time, right, Drew? Is you start where you're at and try to bump it up. And the only thing though, if you, if you haven't started or if you're not saving 15% and maybe you're a little behind some of these rule of thumbs, you might have to invest a little more than the 15% to catch up. And that's totally okay because obviously as you make more money, you should have a little more wiggle room to bump that up a little bit. You know, obviously you can't get crazy um, unless you're some people, you know, get into like the 40, 50% saving of your income. But just keep that in mind. If you're a little bit behind, there's no fret. You know, you're you, if you're 40 or if you're 50, you still have got, tw- you know, almost 20 to 30 years left till you retire at 67. And you've got time to make that up. And if you have to push out your retirement a little bit because you not quite haven't funded it because you didn't invest earlier, that's okay too. It, it, these are just, again, rules of thumb. And I think, the like you said, Drew, the main story is that compounding interest truly gets you there. So why don't we jump then to the 60-year-olds, the people that are coming towards the end of their career. Maybe they're thinking about early retirement, uh, but they're not quite to the 67 of retirement or the retirement age. And so now you're looking at eight times your 
annual salary. And so the 50,000 example that we've been using this entire time, you're looking at having $400,000 saved and invest invested for your retirement. I think the most interesting part of this next milestone or benchmark is going from your 30s to your 40s, you're like trying to three times your money, going from your 40s to your 50s, trying to double your money. And now going to your 40s and 50s, it's a little bit less than doubling your money. And it's starting to ring a bell in my head that jumps out at me is what investments are you in right now? So I think it brings to the forefront that as you go through your investment career, not only you can't just put money away and make and be fine with that. Part of it is planning and part of it is looking at what investments you have and maybe adjusting throughout your journey because by the time you get to 60, you have to start really thinking about, okay, I'm getting closer to retirement age. Have I been putting enough in where maybe I can retire before 67 or am I going to be planning to retire at 67? If that's the case, where's my money at and how much am I willing to risk with my money? And with not that many years left to retirement, you don't really want to risk a whole lot of that money. You want to be able to start slowing down, backing down on some of your investments. And that goes to really being vigilant and just being able to adjust and plan for where your investment and money is going to be going as you get closer to retirement. You know what I absolutely love about the age that we live in is that all of this stuff can just be done for you and done for you at a relatively inexpensive or in a relatively inexpensive way. And the reason I say that is there's a thing called a target retirement fund or a target fund. And essentially what that is, they're in 401ks, they're in IRAs. It's basically saying, okay, I know that in 2060, 2000 or 2060 that I'm going to retire. Well, I can put all my money in a 2060 fund and that's going to do all the balancing of assets appropriately based on how far out I am from retirement. So say that right now I'm pretty far from retirement. It's going to be a majority in equities or stocks. So let's say say 80% and 20% in fixed income or bonds, CDs, things like that. Well, as I get closer to retirement, that proportion is going to shift. And so once I get to age 60 and say I'm seven years out from that retirement date, maybe now my portfolio looks like 50-50 or even like uh, 40% equities and 60% fixed income, but it does it all for you. Obviously, you pay a little bit for that fund, but you can do that if you just want one place to set it and forget it, which I think is pretty cool. I personally don't invest into those because I rather allocate the money based on what I think is most appropriate for me and my family. But that is an option if you don't want to go down the route of hiring a financial advisor to do it for you. Yeah, that's a very great point. And you know, something to talk with those target funds is, yes, they're set it, forget it. Yes, they can do everything for you. And they'll kind of balance it out with probably whatever statistics that are out there. I'm sure there's a bunch of actuaries out there that could do yep, that, that type algorithms. of numbers. Uh, but you know, something that, to mention there is, it's not as high a risk, so you might not have as much reward out of it. So like in your younger years, you definitely want to have more risk. And at what age is the target fund, go target fund going to be canceling or, you know, start slowing down that risk a little bit? Those are things to keep in mind too, where yes, it's set or for, just something to know, I guess. It's, yes, it's set it, forget it. But if you're really looking or comparing yourself to somebody else and, hey, I just made, you know, 20% last year and you're saying, oh, I, you know, made, but what I was supposed to, uh, maybe it's 10%. And then you're like, why did I not make it much? It's like, because there's algorithms, because they can start slowing down depending on age and everything else like that. And they don't want to keep you in as risky, um, type of fund. So that's something to keep in mind too, if you are going to go that route. Most definitely. And I think one thing to note is that you can't, compare yourself to others when it comes to investing because everyone's going to have different strategies. And the only way you can really compare yourself is if you're going the same route as someone else, right? Because some people are going to have more risk tolerance than others. I take myself, for example, I'm a pretty conservative guy, but I invest solely in stocks and well, and then Bitcoin as well. But for my retirement, most is all stocks. Whereas someone might 
like an index fund where someone might do individual company stocks for their retirement because they can get higher returns. And so they would have to save less or have a bigger nest at the end, but there's risk to that. And so I think just bringing that out is like, Hey, don't compare yourself to others and how they're doing. And obviously money is not really talked about all that much anyways, but when it is, and you see it on TV or in the news or whatever it is, just know that, you know, just focus on your plan. You've said it because you have goals of your own and don't compare yourself to someone else that else that might be doing better because for everyone that's doing better, there's probably someone doing worse and you just got to focus on yourself. When I hear that, it just brings to mind. It's like, if you hear anybody go to casino, they never tell you they're losing stories. <laughs> right, so exactly, like when exactly. people say to tell you you're winning stories, you have to always take with a grain of salt because right. they've all had the bad days. Like you feel like you have. So like we're all in the same boat, but what tends to you, what you tend to hear are the, the glory stories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They don't tell you when they lost 20%, but they'll tell you when they gained it. Yeah. So Drew, the last age here is 67. So this is retirement age. So this is now the money that you, you know, you're stopping working. This is the money that you're going to live off of for the rest of your life. And so in this article, they state that by 67, you're going to need 10 times your income to retire off of and to live off of for the rest of your life. And I think Drew right now is a really good place to plug that, hey, should you count for things like social security? And I always say, no, don't plan on having social security for retirement. But if you get it, it's that nice icing on top because you're going to have that 10 times your income. You're going to have social security and maybe you might even have a pension thrown in there depending on you know the benefits that you have had. Yeah. I mean, social security is an interesting one to talk about, at least in the retirement. I don't know if we, I don't think we talked about in the beginning of this because I think we talked about before we went live and just right now they said it's going to be a huge uh, cost of living adjustment here coming up uh, for this next year. I think they always take it off of the third quarter of the previous year. Uh, so right now we have one more month. So the rest of September here to go before they actually come up with the number, but I think they're estimating anywhere from, I think like 8.3, 8.7% cost of living adjustment for social security. And if those cost of living adjustments continue to grow, because I think this last one, they're estimated to be the highest in 40 years. I want to say like how, like if they keep going up like that, how much, you know, everybody always talks about unemployment's not going to be there when you're retirement. And if they keep increasing that amount that's going towards Social Security, maybe that's showing a less probability of Social Security actually being there by the time you retire. So uh, I think when you're looking at this 10 times your income, definitely look at it as your own personal investings or like your pensions or your uh, stocks or whatever businesses you might have on the side that can actually uh, go for that. So like saying like 10 times, you know, this is also a time when maybe your wages are a little bit higher potentially too. So that's something to keep in mind. And like, I don't know, say you made a hundred thousand dollars there. What's 10 times that like a million. Good so, math. Yeah. <laughs> big math guy over here. So, uh, so I mean like right there, if it's like a hundred thousand be a million and I don't know. I feel like a lot of people have a million in their head as like the the benchmark. Like I have to have a million at retirement. They don't know. They don't care like what it's to their income or anything. Uh, but I just read it was actually on Twitter that there's a new it, there's an article out that was saying for millennials and Gen Z, we're going to need about three million dollars to live comfortably in retirement. So that whole million dollar mark. I would say get out of your head because that's probably not going to be enough by the time you're in retirement, unless there's a certain way that you live. Like everybody lives differently too. So that's also something you have to plan out. If you're somebody that really doesn't need much to live, a million dollars might do it for you. Uh, but I feel like if you're in retirement, you want to enjoy those last uh, or those last couple decades of your life. And you want to be able to spoil your grandchildren if you're lucky enough to have some. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, that three million. I think we talked about either last week on the podcast or offline. I don't remember, but that was a big sticker shock to me because, like, dang, like how, how many people are hoping to get to a million, and now you're, you know, tripling that. I wonder. I wonder how. I was just thinking about this as I said it out loud. How many re people in retirement plan for 
grandchildren or like their children, like just kind of like gifts and stuff. Like you probably be like, all right, this is how much my wife and I need during retirement. But is that fixed income involving like some discretionary? Obviously it does, but does it give like discretionary for grandchildren? Just like, oh, I'm going to bring them here. I'm going to buy some presents here. Or I have 10 grandchildren and I want to buy them a birthday present, a Christmas present every year. I think it depends on the person. I know Hannah and I, we talk about that stuff all the time. And we say, okay, well, what kind of retirement do we want to have? Well, we want to like travel. We want to be around family. We want to be able to do trips with our, you know, our family and grandkids. And so we plan that into our, or we put that into our plan we don't have like a dollar, right? It's not like we're going to spend 15 grand on grandkids each year. No idea what that money is, but we know that if we have, you know, say we want to live off of a hundred thousand dollars a year, well, maybe we want to bump that up to 120, 125 to have those extra nice things or whatever it is. Uh, or maybe we want to help save for in a college fund. I, I don't really know, but so that's kind of the things that we've talked about and have adjusted how much we're saving and investing as we have grown and you know, whatnot. And so you can't really put a dollar amount on it, but I think you can get close and have a general idea of, you know, if that's in the cards for you, great. You can plan for it. And if it's not, that's okay too. Definitely. I, I think that is probably a great spot to just kind of wrap up this article. I agree. So generally speaking, you know, by age 30, it's one time your salary age 40, it's three Age 50, it's six. Age 60, it's eight. And then by retirement, it is 10 times your income. Good rules of thumb, Drew. I think that they might be a little off, you know, talking through the $3 million by retirement for millennials and the next generation, Gen Z. Mm -hmm. It seems like it might be a little off, but, you know, it's all based on your income. So I, but I still think, generally speaking, it's good rule of thumb. So, where do you guys land? Let us, well, you don't have to let us know, but let us know if you found value in this at in any way, shape or form, mm -hmm. uh, wherever you want to reach out to us. And if you're watching on YouTube, YouTube, let us know in the comments below with, but with that, Drew, let's move over to retweet of the week. All right. So I've got a good one this week, at least I think, and Maybe some people might think it's a little political, but I'm quite okay with that because I still think it's pretty funny. And so there's a Twitter account called the Wall Street Silver. And it the title is Nancy the GOT, the GOAT, yeah. as in Nancy Pelosi. And the picture is on the left is Warren Buffett and it states full-time the biggest investing genius delivered an average annual return of 20% for shareholders. And Nancy Pelosi is on the right-hand side and says, part-time stock trader delivered an average annual return of 69% for herself. <laughs> and I absolutely love that because in the investing world, there's this huge thing about politicians in general, but Nancy Pelosi, I think it's like the most of it right now, at least that she makes these big time trades and makes all of this money, even though there's laws around the fact that they can't. And so I just absolutely love that one. So I had to bring that one to the table because yeah. Warren Buffett, the Oracle is obviously 20% and that's 20% year over year is amazing. But then you get people like Nancy, who's just, destroying that and i don't 69 percent is probably not even the right percentage let's be honest i saw that but. as like i saw it was hilarious too because <laughs> i mean it's so true it's like you have a guy that literally spends his whole day pretty much reading financial statements <laughs> exactly and, and could really get any type he could tell you what a business is in like two seconds yeah and then you have the speaker of the house yeah that is involved a lot with policy and she just has these unbelievable returns and her <laughs> husband just makes these just trades that are right. You know, they just seem to be very coincidental. <laughs> Let's see. There's a re I think there's a, there's a reason why almost every politician leaves much wealthier than they began and their salaries yeah. are very small. I think relatively that, speaking, I think that's always like my biggest or thing I can just never understand. If you're a public servant only making, you know, a modest wage, let's say, 
Right. And you can come for the out, work that they do for the work that they do, and then you come out of there a multi, multi, multi millionaire <laughs> times over. Yep. That doesn't make sense to me. Like, I wonder what portfolio, what index funds they're in, <laughs> how much they put away. To be able to get that. I'm pretty sure there's a, there's another Twitter account. I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but it's come across my feed. And I'm it, they track all of like, I think Nancy's trades and they, you know, they have other politicians too in there, but they track all those <laughs> trades and it's just amazing the returns that they get. Yeah. Now, I don't know I, if they don't show the negatives. I've never seen the losses again, but I think they have like the, re- I think they have like the return portfolio percentages because um they have to i believe disclose all of those that they yeah, do exactly but i don't know if that includes any type of their trusts oh because sure. sometimes they have other money that's you know you don't necessarily know is theirs making trades right. so they could be doubling they could be double dipping <laughs> you just never know but yeah, I didn't really have any retweet of the week this this week. Uh, I mean, I uh, what I said I'd be in a fantasy dra- or fantasy league football, fantasy football, and yeah. it was supposed to be the draft on Labor Day, and I completely forgot. So I got an auto drafted team. <laughs> <laughs> it actually turned out to be pretty good, but nice. I had Cam Akers is okay. like one of my like. It is like one of the first running backs picked for me. Yep. Uh, and if anybody follows NFL, that Cam Akers had like almost, zero, I think he had zero touches or like not, almost no touches. I didn't, <laughs> like I said, I auto drafted my team, so I obviously didn't pay attention too yeah. much to the game. But he came out with like no points at all, like zero. There's the other running back that got all the touches, all of the hand, I mean, all the touchdowns, everything. So then as I'm going through Twitter, I just like jumped on the band- bandwagon and retweeted a few <laughs> Cam Akers retweets. It's like some like nice. some monks like bashing some bricks against their balls and be like, yeah, just all the owners of Cam Akers right now. <laughs> and then yeah. have like another one of <laughs> like the Tiger King. And I can't remember like what he said, but he's like, yeah, this is the cab. This is Cam Akers owners being like, <laughs> like I'm going to never financially recover from this <laughs> or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> So that was so I I had, I was able to get a little fun of that, even though I'm probably crying inside because I got an auto drafted <laughs> team and then uh, I didn't even switch my lineup for that nice. week class. So I end up losing by uh not switching. If I would have switched the way I wanted to, I probably would have ended up winning. <laughs> but whatever. Well, I've got another retweet of the week, but I think I'm going to save it for next week because I see okay. that we're at 40 minutes and. I really like this one, so I'll make sure that I share it uh, next All week. All right. But let's go to what's going on in the neighborhood. What is going on in the neighborhood? Anything that's over good, at the Nori household? That's a good question. We, um, well, for one, we did come back from a bachelor party that we were both at, and I had yeah. a very good time. We should have recorded time. our conversation before the podcast because we were talking about how long it has taken us to recover from that weekend. Yeah, I I was, I don't know, I don't really like getting older because I have honestly like two, three day hangovers. Yeah. And so I'm not exactly happy with that as I'm here drinking a whiskey. So I'm, I'm just like hurting <laughs> myself probably. But well, I'm drinking so, a Celsius, which is like 200 milligrams of caffeine. And that kind of can tell you where I'm at. <laughs> oh, you're going to be up all night now. For <laughs> for people who are listening, this is at about close to 10 p.m. Uh, that we're recording this. So yeah. he'll be up for a while. And then <laughs> I think he likes to do his running at about four in the morning. So good luck with that. Um, hey, tomorrow's but, an easy day, day before the race. Oh, races this weekend? Races this weekend. Yep. Nice. Which race yep. is it? So it's in Maple Grove. It's a Elm Creek half marathon. And <clears throat> it's, uh, I forget what time we start. It's like 7 to 8 a.m. So it should be a nice like beautiful running weather, like fifties, maybe Elm Creek. So I'm really is that looking like forward to it. An hour away from you or half an hour. Or... God, what it's like, yeah, 40, 45 minutes. Uh, so it's a little bit of a drive relatively speaking, but it's not terrible. 
Um, but we'll, we will have to get up a little early. Um, like you said, Drew, I am an early riser, except for this week. I've been sleeping until about 6.30 every single day because I just like am exhausted from the weekend. Yeah. But no, I'm super pumped for that. I was a little nervous coming off of a bachelor party <laughs> weekend where you stay up late, you drink beer, and you eat bad food. But I went for a run yesterday where I tried to spin my legs a little bit or run a little bit faster, and I felt really good. So we're going to see how it goes this weekend. Maybe that little my rest goal helped. To, maybe, maybe. My goal is to have a personal best or a personal record this weekend, but we're going to actually see how that plays out. But regardless, I'm pretty fired up for it. I like it. Yeah, it'll be exciting. You have to let me know how you do or put it on the old TikTok so I can well, take a yeah. peek and see how you end up doing if you got your PR or not. But yeah, I mean, that sounds not fun at all for me, but <laughs> uh, good luck with that. I think what I think I'm going to be staying around here this weekend. I don't think there's any big projects around the house either. I had um, today, actually, right before this, I was, our dryer is making some weird noises. So I changed the belt on it and just the handyman I'm trying to be, I try <laughs> to change the belt and the, there you go. Uh, like that. It's like those, that big tumbler that you put your yeah. clothes into. There's yep. some support wheels on the back. So I changed up those because they weren't, okay. uh, is spinning as well as they should be. So I bought some more of those and I'm hoping that that does the trick because this dryer is from like late seventies, early eighties. Jesus, it's still around, just still Dude, kicking. These, all these old appliances just are awesome. Like knock on that's wood, crazy. but like I have a fridge behind me that's that almond color, almond yeah. color. You know, probably yep. the same time that this dryer was bought. Still running. Like I got a new that's fridge wild. upstairs, but I wanted to keep this one because it's still running. It's so good. It's probably not <laughs> that efficient by any means. But it's like those dryers, there's like no, there's not much to them. So it's like really nice. And like, it's hard yeah. for them to break down where it's, they're easy to work on. And there's no like huge electrical, like circuit boards or anything. It just, you have dials that can tell like the electrical parts, say like turn on or off. Right. And so I'm hoping what I did fixes the problem. Uh, I did like a little run and it seemed to work, but there's no clothes in there. So okay. it's hard to say. And um, I'll have to get back to you on tomorrow. <laughs> but so it's been a pretty good handyman year. Nice. I've been pretty happy with myself. That's pretty awesome. Before this podcast, I actually went on a two hour car ride with my son because we went to go pick up my new smoker that I just got. You got a new smoker? I'm pretty fired up. <laughs> Do you get Traeger? It's not. So it's a Weber Smoky Mountain. Where, how do you it's, fit it's in a, your vehicle? It comes in uh, part in threes. Okay. So it's got like the base. It's got the, like the, I, I don't know what the technical term is, but the body. And then it's got the lid. But it's a charcoal smoker stand up. And... Uh, so I got the 20 inch and online they're about 560 bucks brand new. I got this thing for 250. What a steal with a, with the cover, which the cover costs 50 and a bunch of wood to smoke with. How did you and do the guy Craigslist? said, uh, Facebook marketplace Sweet. came in clutch. And the guy actually told me, he's like, yeah, this thing has probably been used only 10 times. And I'm like, nice. that is like the best deal I could have ever found. Yeah, you couldn't pass it up because I was going to say what turned you yeah. off from what made you do that instead of like the <clears throat> offset. But obviously you get a great product for like half the price. Yeah. So I was going to go offset, but I was a little intimidated by like the all wood, not from the actual burning wood, but the fact of like, where is my wood supplier? Like, where do I even go for that? Right? Like, charcoal super easy. You just <laughs> go to the store and it's there. And, in my you know, head, right? Maybe now, it's not that hard. In my head, right now, I'm picturing you having an offset and like you having like your wood guy, and you just like go in there morning with like a coffee and like you're just like the <laughs> regular, like oh, what type of wood we got in here today? Yeah. <laughs> and then you're just like best friends with the wood guy. Yeah. But I actually, so I made the decision to do the Weber Smoky Mountain probably like two weeks ago. 
and I had it in my cart, brand new, everything, and it was going to cost me like eight hundred bucks, and so I or like seven hundred bucks with tax, and got that thing for two fifty, and I was so fired up coming home, like so pumped. Does Liam love when you smoke? You do like the smoking stuff, or is he like pumped up to go get it too, like a like a little car was, ride? It's an hour drive one way, and he was like, "I'm like, buddy, I'm going to go tonight. I'll see you in the morning." And, it's a long car ride. He's like, dad, I want to come. I'm like, buddy, it's long. Like it's a pretty long car ride. He's like, that's okay. Like he's got this little device called a Tony where you just it like has like figures and it plays like stories or music. He's like, I'll just listen to my Tony. And I kid you now, we listened to the same story on repeat for two hours, but I wouldn't trade Wonderful. it because it was fun to hang out with him. Yeah. Fun to but, hang out with him. Got a good smoker. Good old ride. Fire. So fired up though. Go I'm going to get either ribs on it this weekend. Or I'm going to do French dip. We'll see. We'll see. I love it. Well, I still need to try some of your smoke stuff because I see the pictures and they look awesome. Yep. I yep. haven't done the smoking stuff yet. I made some homemade gnocchis the other day, but that was about it. The next appliance on the list is a dehydrator so I can do smoke jerky and then dehydrate it to get that like nice finish on it. Ooh, Dehydrator, definitely a good thing to get. I would definitely get that. But with that said, we should probably wrap this episode up. Uh, t- you know, this episode with all the tangents we had was ultimately about your benchmarks and your rule of thumbs for saving slash investing by age. And to go back, it was by 30, you should have about one time, you know, about the same salary uh, in investing. By 40, it was three times your income. By 50, it was six times your income. 60, it was eight times your income. And 67, or retirement, about 10 times your income. So as a little summary for some benchmarks, remember, if you aren't at those numbers, it's just a rule of thumb. It's something to think about. You can always be higher or lower. And if you haven't started, it should be a good reminder. Maybe get your foot in the door and just start slow and just kind of figure it out and then keep adding along with that uh so with all that said i hope you guys found value in this episode i know uh, it's already episode 60 which is crazy to think about i'm glad if you're listening to this far into the episode i want to thank you and uh with all that said we'll see you guys next week in the neighborhood